Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 841. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's January 30th, 2024. All right, we want to welcome you back to another program of Anglican Unscripted. If you're new here, this is where Kevin and George sit down and talk about what we find interesting in the news today. Our title is Anglican Unscripted, so we're going to talk about some Anglican things and uh, stuff around Anglicanism and religion and uh, news and politics and just a little bit of weather every once in a while. That's how we do it. There are a lot of new subscribers to the channel in the last couple of weeks. Um, we'll get to that in, in a minute. As a new subscriber, please uh, like this episode every time you see it posted on Facebook or YouTube. That helps with the algorithm. Uh, YouTube recently changed their algorithm. They are now promoting longer shows. So if your show is between 40 and 65 minutes, you are upped in their algorithm. They now value time of show more than anything else. So George and I are going to go four hours today, which is fine. You know, we don't mind that at all. We love to talk. Um, and if you do get a chance, go to the comment section. Uh, the last three weeks, the comments have been alive. It's like the hills are alive with the sound of music. The comments are alive with the sound of women's ordination. And uh, we shall uh, uh, continue our conversation there after the show. George, how you been doing? It's been a really good good time here in florida apart from being freezing cold i was in the 60s yeah. this morning when i got left my house i mean i just <clears throat> don't know how i'm going to stand it this uh next month or so yeah. we had our diocesan convention on saturday and then we had our church annual meeting on sunday both great things uh not much happened at the diocesan convention, which is always a good thing. Yes. But what did happen <clears throat> was the bishop's speech, his presidential address. He said something that I haven't really heard in an Episcopal presidential address. And listen, I read most of them that come out. Mm -hmm. And Justin Holcomb basically said, the only thing that we have to offer the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ which to me is a powerful statement because so many dioceses talk about social justice. It talks about this, it talks about that. But Bishop Holcomb has basically put us <clears throat> squ squarely on the track that we are to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to the world around us and not get hung up on the latest fads. I'm really encouraged by that. That is encouraging. I mean, I remember in the mid 2000s the diocese of connecticut had like 28 people on staff and not one of them had the task of doing evangelism there was social justice there was uh feeding for the poor i mean there's a whole bunch of other things but none of them were about what we offer the world mm -hmm. we offer the world jesus and the bishop at that time Probably didn't have a good understanding of what that was either, but uh, I'm, Andrew I, I, Smith, I don't think he knew what it was. I don't. This is not a. We are not defaming anybody. Allegedly, he did not know what he was doing, and that certainly led to the breakup of the the diocese uh, with the Connecticut Six. So uh, onward and upward. Uh, I mean, to my relief, George, uh, the Calvin Robinson thing has kind of blown over, and not much more is happening. And we can talk about other news. You you, you mentioned some divinity stuff, some uh, seminaries we get to talk about. Welby and Francis took a vacation together. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about Alistair Biggs. But before we get to that, let's just f f bring people up to speed on the latest stuff with Calvin Robinson, which, of course, it's still in the news. Why would it not be still the news? Of course, it's still the news. George, um, let's talk about the latest uh, now, oh, I need to back up here. Since the time Anglican TV has uh, presented Anglican Unscripted, uh, George and I had a rule where we will not talk about our bishops in, in uh, as such as, you know, I, if my if my bishop does something stupid, I will not throw him under the bus in, in respect for an episcopacy that I'm following. Uh, in the same respect to you, you had uh, a bishop who was a bit f uh, flaky at times, and you would come on here and say, we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I know. <laughs> and so, uh, I live in Florida, 
and uh, this is going to surprise a lot of you. The church I go to is a church plant under Bishop Todd Hunter of some uh, ACNA uh, uh, infamy. Uh, I Once Bishop Todd Hunter has built this church, he is turning it over to an Alex Farmer, the Bishop of the Gulf Atlantic. And so he will be my bishop at that time. So in today's program, we're going to be talking about these two bishops. But look at Kevin. I won't be doing a lot of that talking. I have to turn that over to George because they're not his bishop. So I, I want to back that up. We're, we're not changing the rule. Um, I love Alex Farmer. I love Todd Hunter. Some of the things they do may uh, cringe me a little bit. Uh, so we have co-host to handle uh tough tough topics we don't want to talk about individually george let's talk now about uh the last three or four days with the the calvin robinson affair the mere anglicanism affair the woman's orders affair i don't know let help me out here well yeah. the calvin robinson affair began at the <clears throat> mere anglicanism conference where calvin gave a speech uh an address where he attacked feminism as one of the root causes or the root cause of the decline of the West. Talk about effeminate clergy, effeminate church. How ca feminism was the stalking horse of critical Mar critical cultural theory, Marxist theory. Um, this led to a uh, reaction, both personal uh, snubs and people telling Calvin they hated his talk talk because of his perceived attack on women clergy, to the leader of mere Anglicanism, the director, uh, Jeffrey Miller, and Bishop Chip Edgar of the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina, calling Calvin into Bishop Edgar's office and essentially dressing him down and saying he was not going to be participating in a roundtable discussion later that day. So in essence, he was being disinvited or dis fired or disfellowshipped, whatever you want, mid-conference. They still paid <clears> his <throat> air ticket home. but uh, And just, they paid his honorarium. Honorarium. They paid for his ticket there, food and all that stuff, a thing. Um, and he was allowed to participate as a, uh, a, not a speaker anymore, but certainly a viewer. And so this was round one of the Calvin Robinson affair. And that basically focused on his being canceled. So we have the uh, whole topic was raised of free and unfettered discussion among Orthodox Anglicans. How is it that uh, we can condemn the Episcopal Church for their cancel culture and all the things that they've done in kicking out seven, 800 clergy who don't hold right views when Anglicans turn around and cancel somebody who holds a minority view in South Carolina. It's Diocese of South Carolina has women clergy. So first, that was the issue of uh, freedom of thought, freedom of exchange. The <clears> second <throat> issue was the topic itself, women's orders. And so those who supported uh, Calvin Robinson's stance on women's order, many of them rounded round to rally behind him, while those who opposed him uh, posed women's orders, jumped on that bandwagon. And so what we saw was uh, Jeff Miller, Jeffrey Miller, basically saying, uh, giving an explanation under the, an official statement saying Calvin was disinvited because he didn't follow instructions. So in essence, this was a power issue. Calvin was not doing what Jeffrey Miller wanted to do. And Jeffrey Miller is on the uh, opposed side of women's orders. But then Bishop Edgar put out a speech, put out a statement, pastor <clears throat> statement in South Carolina that was all about women's orders. And this is why Jeff uh, Calvin was uh, sat on. So that was round one. Round, and with, that was all of last week. And on the social media, wouldn't let it go. That the uh, sort of statements going back. And then George and Kevin got involved. And Jeff Walton. And Jeff Walton. And Jeff Walton had... Uh, was interviewed by Kevin, and Jeff Walton was an observer at the conference, a press person, and he gave a press person's response. 
which was totally unacceptable to some people because Jeff Walton was trying to just say, this is what happened instead of this is what should have happened. And so Jeff Walton, who immediately then flew off to vacation in Colombia. Smart guy, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I saw him on pictures riding his bike, bicycle in Medellin, and I don't think I would do that, but maybe it's better these days. I don't yeah. know. Well, Jeff then gets savaged, and Kevin gets savaged, and so Kevin uh, defends him, because why didn't you talk to Calvin Robinson before you talk to a witness, uh, Jeff Walton? Well, Kevin, when did you contact Calvin Robbins? Well, right after my, right after the uh, Jeff Miller and uh, Chip Egger put out their statements for public, I now had both sides of the story. A great time to interview Calvin. Uh, if you, and at no point was I not going to interview Calvin. Some people are saying, "Why don't you interview Calvin?" I have sent him an invitation to be interviewed on Anglican Scripted, or to co-host an episode with me, or to just talk about women, whatever you want to talk about, uh, I'm here for you. He has not replied to that. I think he's still mad at me, and it's a timing issue, or I'm insensitive, or whatever. Uh, I'm sorry for any measure on that part of mine, but I'm also a journalist. I don't it, you. I, there's only one topic I remember a long, long time ago where I interviewed an individual before the whole story was out. Okay. And I regretted that. I generally make it a rule that I do not interview people or be, bring people on the program until both sides are known in the public. Uh, I will interview a person who will just give me his side. I have no trouble with that. But I want a counterpoint to that to exist so we can ask those questions of the counterpoint that makes for a great interview well blah 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 uh, uh, a said this about you what do you say well a is wrong a is a blank hole <laughs> you know okay whatever and so that that makes for a much better interview than just getting a one-sided uh uh description of what happened as you're flying off to london or where, wherever else that's that's Anglican Unscripted, and that's been our history. And if that's not good enough for you, I there's nothing I can do about that. I and I, I'll go on. I'll I, I will live another day. Uh, just ask uh, um, the AMIA. But uh, in as such, <laughs> that's why we didn't interview him right away. He was off well, on a plane, and and Jeff Walton, to his credit, it m maybe regret right now. Well, said, sure, Kevin, I'll tell you what I saw, and I talked to Calvin after it happened. Why? Well, you can't beat that. <laughs> well, so that so the next phase is Calvin Robinson then goes on and gives a uh, number of statements on video, gives mm -hmm. a detailed discussion of what happened. And people <clears throat> all, you know, respond uh, affirming or condemning Calvin's response. And, you know, at this point, I'm thinking, okay, let's let's just let it you know take its course mm -hmm. then uh some bishops wrote pastoral letters todd hunter uh who's the bishop of c4so which always sounds like a, an explosive to me uh, uh, i feel chest pain coming out of it. keep keep talking <laughs> it get, put out a uh, basically a response from a critical theory perspective um, a more uh, in, an, an intersectionality perspective that may be over interpreting it from my no, part, I don't but... think you're. I don't think you are because I'm not seeing anybody even responding to it on social media because it was that bad. I mean, of all the stuff being discussed on social media right now, he, his statement kind of was dead on arrival. Yeah. And then on Sunday, uh, some, one of our viewers, and I thank our viewers for doing this, yeah. uh, never worry if you send me a, a news item that I would somehow say, oh, well, I already knew this. I may know it, but there are many times when I don't. And this was an example. Sunday afternoon, I was sent a link to a sermon, a service given in uh, a 
Gulf Atlantic Diocese Church, where Alex Farmer was doing some confirmations. And he Bishop, had a Bishop Alex Farmer of the diocese, yeah. Yeah, and the, that's headquarters in Jacksonville and their cathedrals in Tallahassee. And I've known Alex, well, from the point when my children were young teenagers, just becoming teenagers, he was the uh, clergy chaplain at the summer camps they would go to. Um, you know, and so I've known this guy 10, 15 years. He's a great uh, guy. I, I love him dearly. Yeah. So I have nothing but good experiences with Alex Farmer. And Alex Farmer gave a, a, a sermon and it caused a bit of a ruckus. And I'm going to read to you a portion that was transcribed by a friend of the show named Mark Marshall. Uh, he, he He's one of these people that gives wonderful tips and has his own website that I yeah. commend you to look at. Um, Mark has a different brief than Kevin and I do, but, uh, you know, we're all part of the same general genre, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, Mark has typed out what uh, Alex Farmer said, and I actually re watched the video to make sure this is what he said. And the pertinent part is this. This is Alex Farmer speaking. <clears throat> Recently, I was at a conference up in Charleston. Maybe some of you have heard about it. And a brother got up and began to speak. And it sounded as if he might speaking a word of truth to the congregation. But the more I listened, there was no love in his message. There was no compassion, no grace. And increasingly, increasingly since that time, I've recognized that, in fact, this person wasn't led of the spirit, but in fact was giving himself over to an unclean spirit in the midst of our congregation. And ultimately, he was invited off of a panel and chastised for his willingness to give himself over. I'll stop the, the quote there. This caused a new wave where people accused Bishop Farmer of saying <clears throat> that uh, Calvin was demon-possessed or a false Christian or a false teacher. And I wrote to Bishop Farmer and I wrote to his press officer. And as of our going to tape here on Tuesday, they've not responded. I have questions. Now, <laughs> I was thinking, now, Alex and I, Alex younger than I am, which I don't hold that against him, but he's still yeah. younger than I am. He, okay, he has more gray hair than you, but yes, okay. he's younger. Uh, but we've both been priests for a good long time, priest, in his case, priest and a bishop. And of the thousands of sermons I've given, I probably said a few boneheaded things in my time where I'm on a, I'm moving along and I say something that I hadn't really meant to say in that way or thought it through. So the first thing I wanted to say was, Calvin, uh, Alex, were you trying to say that the spirit of discord and dissension that arose after the speech, which is undeniable, there were people upset, People are happy, but we've got discord and dissension over the women's orders issue. That arose from an unclean spirit. Or are you really saying that Calvin was possessed of an unclean spirit? And what was the unclean spirit? Was the unclean spirit, in other words, trying to get him to tease out what he was saying? Because if you take it on a very flat reading, it, you know, then you basically see this as a big smackdown to Calvin Robinson. Is that what it was meant to? What was the intent here? And so far, I haven't been able to get that clarified. Well, did not Catherine Jeffrey Shorey say, say the same thing about Bishop Mark Lawrence? Uh, no, she said it about the Apostle Paul, uh, right. if I remember correctly, <laughs> where yeah. the Apostle Paul tried to cast out a demon from the yeah, slave yeah. girl That's in right. uh, right. Ephesus. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Catherine said, who is he to deprive her of her good living? And that was just male patriarchy and all that. Oh, Kevin, that just <sighs> gave us such a, such, well, we had six months off that sermon alone. Oh, we did. I mean, but, and, and we will profit, sadly, from this contention over women's orders. Uh, you know, we make money off a little advertising here that goes back into the show that helps pay your way to go to things like the uh, provincial meeting in June. And uh, we don't want to profit off discord in the church. That's not our thing. But we do want to report on it. I was mm -hmm. told day one in Plano that the bishops had made an agreement 
they, they would not publicly name another bishop uh, in talking about stuff like the Episcopal Church did. The Episcopal Church would air their laundry in public, and that the ACNA bishops would not air their laundry in public. And I kind of see some laundry going up on the line here, George. And, they're, they're, and you know... Well, Kevin, you've been in touch with the ACNA on this point sure. unofficially. Unofficially. And yeah. their response is, it's got nothing to do with <laughs> us. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they didn't deny that they knew it happened. But, you know, basically, uh, we flew in, we flew out. Uh, Foley had to fly over to a consecration in a, in a foreign country. He wasn't there. He left early. He probably left before Calvin. And so, uh, but uh, this in is In other what, words, this yeah. is, you for those who want to say, ah, proof positive that the ACNA mm -hmm. is whatever you want to ascribe to it, this was not an ACNA provincial no. activity. It was a conference organized and <clears throat> run by members of the ACNA. But that you know, it's like saying everything that George Conger does is representative of the Episcopal Church. There are a great many Episcopalians who would beg, <laughs> beg to differ. It's right. all, all of them. <laughs> well, yeah. well the, then after this, <clears throat> then Calvin Robinson came back. And Calvin's response to Alex Farmer, uh, and again, if you wanted to find it all in one place, look on Mark Marshall's web uh, uh, substack page, or you can look at the original on uh, uh, Twitter and and uh, Calvin's Substack page, and we will basically be publishing all the documents on Anglican Inc. So I probably should say, look at Anglican Inc. Don't look at these other guys, just for our clicks. But here's what Calvin wrote back. Now, Calvin had a choice to uh, take a charitable interpretation, to ignore it, to hit hard. And here's what he wrote. Calvin responded, to have feminists and white knights walking out whilst I read from scriptures was bad enough. To have a bishop decide that I gave myself over to unclean spirits in order to subtly deceive the congregation is too much. If this was the secular world, I would call it libelous. This is worse than that. For a shepherd to hear the truth and call it demonic, and to hear orthodoxy and call it deception, this is apostasy. These wolves in sheep's clothing are leading their flock astray. What began with Bishop Chip Edgar and Bishop Todd Hunter releasing uncharitable statements seeped in critical theory has ended in Bishop Alex Farmer outright calling me a deceiver with an unclean spirit. I'll pause there. Calvin has decided to do a polemical response. And so Here's I'm going to. I'm get, last week, Kevin, you said people don't hate Kevin. This week, people don't hate George. There are everybody, a few. Everybody hates, hate everybody hates Kevin. Everybody hates Jay Walton. Come on, George. We're Who's not a point George? where we're not a point where pox on both your houses. You know, Alex Farmer may have made and said something unintentional, silly, or if he did, it was over the top. Calvin's response is definitely over the top. I know I could be charitable and say Calvin could be writing out of heat. But first off, I disagree. I went and reread Calvin's <clears throat> speech, and I disagree with its intellectual premise. That feminism is the root cause of all these issues. I don't think that can be intellectually justified because there are many feminisms, first wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave feminism. Well, but it's feminism, not just that. But we do. I do agree that feminism is one of the seeds Certainly, one of many causes. But yes, the, but feminism finds its root. Feminism yeah. finds its root in Christian belief and practice. Mm -hmm. It may have been hijacked by some modern proponents of it, what we call third and fourth wave feminism. Well, it has it been ridiculous. It, well, it's it has been hijacked because nobody can no longer define what a woman is. Mm -hmm. Feminism has been hijacked by the and, the most evil of people. Yeah, and we've and we're actually in a place where what we would call a third wave feminist like J.K. Rowling is denounced by fourth wave feminists as being anti-feminist because she doesn't accept the tra that transgender <clears throat> people a man can become a woman and you must refer to them as woman. This is all that is true, and that is all part of uh, 
gender theory, queer theory, the whole intersectionality mess. Mm -hmm. But Calvin's intellectual uh, uh, foundation for all this is is fairly weak. Now, I, I disagree with that, but do I think he's filled with an evil spirit, spirit? No, but first off, I think mere Anglicanism got themselves in trouble because they wanted Calvin Robinson not to be Calvin Robinson. Uh, Cal, uh, Calvin Robinson is a polemicist. Doesn't have... Uh, you, okay, define that. Not all of I mean, our audience has a doctor degree. Uh, he is someone who makes arguments and is a good per he is a akin to a Tucker Carlson type. Uh, somebody who makes passionate, strong arguments in favor of a particular side. Calvin is guilty of two of the three things that uh, Alex Farmer said. Very little love and uh, very little charity. In other words, Calvin is going into a place to speak where there are going to be women clergy, where there's a strong tradition of that. And he is provocative on that exact point when there are lots of other things to be provocative about. Did Calvin know, was this, was Calvin deliberately provocative? Well, yes, that's what you bring him in for. He's great at it. I mean, he's great. That's why he was on TV. But sometimes Calvin, I think, loses the plot. You know, for instance, when he got fired from GB News, uh, it, he was defending his colleagues, but he was also denigrating his bosses. Well, at the end of the day, the bosses are who pay you. And if you get fired for doing that, you shouldn't be that surprised. <clears throat> but, you know, that was the stand he made it on principle. But wh where I'm going from this is that um, there's a degree of pastoral immaturity on all sides here which is upsetting. There's a failure to try to reach a higher ground. There's a failure to be charitable and listening and hearing. And that failure began with mere Anglicanism because they knew what they were asking for. They knew what they were getting. And yet they didn't want Calvin, they want, I'm going to be, they wanted Calvin to be a, I believe, they wanted him to be a token black conservative Anglican. They wanted a unicorn to parade to the people in South Carolina. And when Calvin came as Calvin, and Calvin has a long history of refusing to play the token game, it sort of upset things. And he made it worse by attacking one of the sacred cows held by many of the people in that audience. He was a disappointment, not, not so much for what he said, but not for what he wasn't saying what they were hoping he would say. So mere Anglicanism made a mistake in that sense of expecting something. And then when they didn't get what they thought they were buying, blowing up. So Jeff Miller is right. He disobeyed in Jeff Miller's mind. And Alex sure. Farmer is right. You, you know, friend, fella, you're not reading your audience. You could have made these same arguments without uh, insulting. And you weren't being irenic, you were being polemic. Yeah, but that but that is Calvin. I mean, yes. is Calvin making a mistake for being Calvin? I don't think so. I've expressed this before. I'm a huge fan of Calvin Robinson, who currently dislikes Kevin. Well, I don't care about that. But I'm a huge fan because... He, like many other people like him, get people to think. And his words are succinct about what he believes. He is able to defend what he believes. So many times I run into people with just the most uh, one-sided issue, and I ask them about it, and they don't even know what they're talking about. They don't know their issue. And I find this nine times out of ten. You know, people don't know their issue they're defending. Calvin Robinson gets a 11 out of 10 for knowing the issues he's defending. He knows it. Now, did, did he correctly uh, line up critical theory with Marxism and feminism as a sole cause case correlation? No, not at all. Not even close. I mean, 
I've read some that have. There are papers out there that I've read in the last five or six years that do a really good job of doing that. Uh, Calvin's written at night, last minute maybe, just didn't uh, take more things into consideration. Is feminism recently a a, a, uh, a serious causation of what's going on around us with public education, uh, CRT in our schools, and our universities, and our churches? Yeah. DEI uh, taking over corporations? Yeah, it, it's horrid. Um, feminism is a part of a bigger master plan, a, a small part of a bigger master plan Satan is using to take down uh, this Western Christian culture that was fought for for 2,000 years. And Absolutely. he's doing a great yeah. job. And, uh. and feminism has been distorted and almost destroyed. Where are the feminists talking about the rape victims in <clears throat> Gaza? <clears throat> We don't, they're absolutely silent on this. Whereas a generation ago, uh, you know, this would have been the issue front and center where rape is an instrument of war, how abhorrent. And now we have the current fourth wave generation of feminists saying, this is just payback for the indignity suffered upon the Palestinian people. Rape is a tool of war. So, I agree with you, Kevin, but I would rather the terms be clarified uh, because not all feminism is bad. I, there is much merit to it. And I'll say something that will piss off some people, which is Christ was one of the first feminists. He had Mary and Martha at his feet, hearing the same teachings that the boys, the apostles heard. Um, he, sent, he sent off a prostitute to be the first uh, evangelist. Well, Mary Magdalene might have not been Mary, a no, 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 not, not Mary, the, the lady Mary. at the well. The, le no, oh. the lady at the well. He said, uh, oh, so, go. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, never mind. You're right. You're right. 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 No. In, in, my, in my reading of Scripture, she's the first. Um, but I, I read Scripture uh, in the New and Old Testament that really talks about a structure of the church and God's structure for humankind. And see, I am persuaded by my study of the Bible, informed by the books that I read, that uh, God is, uh, that, that the tradition that we had of excluding women was unfounded. And, you know, one of the people I draw upon heavily is N.T. Wright, Tom Wright. Some may love him, some may hate him. But my readings of the Bible, but it is certainly not driven by CRT or critical race theory. Uh, but, and I do, well, I think at this point, I don't want to repeat myself. <laughs> well, you know, and yet people show up here for what Kevin and George think, but they show up for the, the news as well. But here, here's uh, a, here's yeah. a, one of, uh, it, this is, this is emblematic of a bigger problem that we're having in the, certainly in the Episcopal church. Mm -hmm. We're seeing bishops consecrated who have either no pastoral experience or their second career women who come in in their fifties and sixties in their 50s and are have had a successful career before and go to high office because they can they're good managers they ran a university this and that one of the things that being a parish priest for a very long time teaches you is how to keep diverse people in the pulpit together in the pew together if you are going to basically be a monoculture church um that may be your call, but when you're a church in a small town, like I am, I have Anglo-Catholics, I have Charismatics, I have Evangelicals, I have Liberals, I have people all across the spectrum, all of whom are sincere in their belief in Jesus Christ as the one true risen Lord. Yet if I were to constantly harp on my pet uh, issues, so in other words, how it works out in practice is, um, at our adult education forum uh, yesterday, uh, month, Sunday, excuse me, month, uh, we talked about abortion. And somebody asked, "Well, George, why are you know why don't what do you, you know, why don't you talk about abortion from the pulpit all the time?" And I said, "Well, it's a very practical answer. None of you people are going to are unable to have babies. It's not a pressing issue. You don't have any Sarahs. Okay, yeah. fine. Well, we could, we could." <laughs> But in other words, uh, and 
actually we've had four babies born in the past six months mm -hmm. but you know the, where we are in florida where you are kevin in webster florida abortion is an issue for our grandchildren fornication that's the big issue and that's what i harp on in the pulpit in other words you know your congregation you know what needs to be talked about you know how to reach and meet the people where they are in their walking Christ. And if you don't have that experience of trying to keep all these things in tension, how do I be faithful in the topic of abortion? Well, basically for most people, it's an academic issue here, and it's easy to talk about because we can condemn them when the real issue is you're living with a man who you're not married to because that gives you a higher social security. Hold on, did you just point to me? I am not living with a man I'm not supposed to. <laughs> I'll point to the person in the party. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Just, you know. In, another, in other words, the sometimes these people come across the church world like Icarus. You know, they just are flying so very high and can do extraordinary things, but then they get too close to the sun and it melts the wax in their wings and they fold to earth. Well, and I sometimes think that the art of being a good pastor is knowing how close to the sun to get without melting your wings and that and doing it in the way of christ okay mm -hmm. in the way of christ christ spoke the truth but was so compelling that both sides of the truth wanted to hang out with him mm -hmm. okay he people who sat down with him at the, the dinner table the tax collectors the prostitutes uh the cheats the you know fellows people all over were there to listen to a man tell them the truth because they were compelled to because of his character and the presence of the holy spirit he he traveled with and his love for them and as such i i'm not making a, a complete comparison here people watch this show because we show respect to both sides of issues like this okay i do not get it nor do i allow you to to disrespect a, a different position on, on, on women's orders uh, the the College of Bishops of the ACNA have uh, come up with what they're doing now. Uh, I think it's going to bite them in the butt, as this kind of shows. But in as such, we treat everybody as we do with respect. We treat Colin Coward and other people's uh, on that topic with respect. You know, we're here to to show. Now, I don't have an open mind. Don't don't think that. But I love you as Christ loves you. And I, I want to see the best for yourself. And I want to see the best for me as we try to draw, draw closer to the living God through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope that for you. Please hope that for me. I pray that for you. Please pray that for me. And I, both, no, no matter who I agree with or disagree with on women's orders or... Uh, same-sex relationships or church politics, I have the respect for them. I'm not going to indaba all day, but I respect you. <laughs> and you do too, George. I, we've had off-camera conversations where sometimes you blow me away with your respect. You know, so well, Calvin is right. <clears throat> Calvin is right on the foundational issue, mm -hmm. which is that uh, critical cultural theory Um and there are really four elements of it that I just want to hit because this sure. is what Calvin is exactly right. <clears throat> All of these things, whether it's third or fourth wave feminism, gender theory, race relations, it is based on social binarianism or the concept of hegemonic <clears throat> power. And then also believes in a lived experience in social justice. These four buzz phrases have robbed the classical tradition based upon Socrates uh, and a little bit less on Plato, Plato from how we think and how we follow the path towards God. Yeah. So now we've got my church, the Episcopal church is fully into the social binary thing. In other words, in Christ, there is male and female. There is black and white. There is slave and free or rich or poor where Paul says there isn't. So that social binary thing is there, that there's hegemonic power that because I'm a member of the uh, white oppressor male patriarchal class, I create a worldview that I force people not in my position to uh, succumb. So a black lesbian athlete 
you know, like that basketball player was in Russia, she may have more power in the world than I do, but because of her position, she of being black, being lesbian, and being a woman, she has less power. In other words, that sense of hegemony that I will never get it and can never get it and should never get it. Because it's a because lie. Of the, because, and at the end of the day, yeah. the social justice angle. Calvin's right on all those things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But yeah, how I, we get to the final answer, I don't know if I agree with some of the steps he's taken. The first answer to our biggest problem right now is we need to capture and redefine what love is. I've, I'm in a, a community full of people going through what I'm going through. I have two children right now who won't talk to me uh, or communicate with Jill and I in, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, they say because we're too spiritual or we're on the wrong side of politics, whatever it is. Um, the influencers they have in their life had told them to cancel people who are toxic to you people who would ha say no to you, people who would try and offer a different suggestion than pop culture offers. In this community, about half the parents, regardless of the politics, regardless of the church, regardless of many other uh, factors, have uh, children who will not talk to them because they've listened to pop culture that says the first thing to do to make yourself happy is to wipe out all the toxic people in your life, anybody would, who would say no to you. The second thing this woke generation has done is they've redefined love. Love has been redefined to, I love you because. I love you because you're gay. I love you because you're queer. I love you because, you know, name the attribute uh, or adjective where I was brought up to understand, I love you as. My father loved me as his son. My mom loved me as her son. I love my brother as my brother. There's no because in any of that. But woke has added because to love. Mm -hmm. And it's perverted it. It's made love an imposter. And in this, we have to retake that. I love you as i love you as a creation of god i love you as someone who god loves i don't love you because anything we need to retake that and that's that's got to be our mission to start taking back the definitions that god gave us unconditional love god gave it to us George, Kevin, uh, we've done, Kevin, yeah. did you what? did you take a shot of espresso? Because you're very eloquent this morning. You're oh, really up on your. This is <laughs> this is a conversation I had with one of the, the parents in the, in my community. She goes, I, I well, and she's not Christian. She I don't get it. He won't talk to me. He wears a dress now. I, you know this whole thing. And I, and you know I wanted to explain to her my experience. My experience is. My, I have one child who loves to be loved unconditionally, and we have a great relationship with her. We have two other children that want to be loved because of something. And that isn't love. Mm -hmm. That's, you know what that is? That's tribalism. And I didn't raise a tribe, I raised a family. And I'm willing to hold out for the very long game. My game of football goes a million quarters. And, uh, you know, hopefully God can redeem the situation. But, you know, as Christians, go out there and reclaim what love is. Uh, but, George, 43 minutes on one topic. Let, let's, let's move on. I pray that this is resolved. I pray that uh, Calvin and Alex and uh, Jeff and Chip and Todd and everybody can, you know, start to work in peace in this. Um, because right now we're seeing what the Episcopal Church used to do, and they used to attack each other. And once we start doing that in the, the ACNA, you've just made yourself tech. Good job. Congratulations. Next topic on our... Oops, I completely closed that screen. Next topic. <laughs> Church Divinity School of the Pacific. Okay, so you and I have talked about this before. Where have all the good seminaries gone? When you were in seminary in the late 80s and 90s, uh, Yale was not, not a bad seminary. Harvard had a seminary. Uh, great places around the world had seminaries. Oxford, there's one up in Canada that was a good seminary. Uh, you went to the West Coast, there's probably 
almost six or seven good seminaries. The Episcopal Church had good seminaries. Anglican, even the Lutherans had some good seminaries. Methodists, not so. Yeah, Methodists had two good seminaries. This day and age, George, I look out on the plains of the, the great America and the plains of the world, and I see a handful of seminaries that have survived uh, liberalism, and I can name them on 10 fingers. Less than 10. Less, well, yeah, less than 10. Well, I have small fingers. But let's talk. You know, the Church of Divinity School of the Pacific was purchased by Trinity Wall Street to save it. Uh, and they've just announced now that they're canceling the grad, all the grad programs. CDSP announced yesterday, the 29th, that they were pulling out of the Graduate Theological Union, which was a consortium of theological schools in and around the Berkeley, California area. They would no longer offer a PhD, an MA, MATS, all those different degrees. They would instead focus on being a hybrid MDiv, non-residential, uh, seminary formation program. And so what this means is that instead of going to Church of Divinity School of the Pacific for three years, you stay at home, take classes online, and maybe once or twice a year go for uh, a week or two weeks intensive. This is the, uh, and the reason is financial. Even when Trinity Wall Street came in and basically bought their buildings and then sort of did a lease back to keep them alive, they still cannot finance and keep their operations going because part part of it will be the old model of a residential seminary is just not feasible in the modern era. But as you point out, Kevin, there are some that are very successful. Uh, West Coast, there's Fuller uh, down, the, down the coast in Pasadena. Um, nowadays in the Episcopal Church, when I was in school, there were 11. Uh, now there are really only four or five. Um, uh, Yale will always be there because of Yale. Mm -hmm. uh, Virginia Theological Seminary acquired General Seminary. And the Episcopal Divinity School went into the Union Theological Seminary, but then at last year was kicked out of Union and is now sort of floating free. So it's all a paper seminary with no students. Reformed uh, Episcopal still going? Uh, in the Episcopal Church, but yeah. uh, Bexley Hall uh, now... Uh, is on the campus of a Lutheran seminary, I think, or it's now been moved to the University of Chicago, I'm not sure. Seabury Western is gone. The Shota House has had money problems since the 1840s, but they've always managed to muddle through because it has a niche uh, spot. For instance, uh, for residential students uh, from my diocese, they're sent to the Shota House. Um, so they'll get sort of a steady stream of conservative and then that leaves the church, uh, church Episcopal Seminary of the Southwest in Austin. So, and Swanee, University of the South, which because it's part of the university, will survive. But the, the whole, uh, what we're saying, those who are successful are people like Gordon Conwell or uh, Fuller that are sort of non-denominational, where they can sort of pack in a whole cross-section of people, train them, and get them out into the world. And as well as some of the big Baptist ones are doing quite well. This is probably vindication of the phrase, go woke, go broke. Um, well, here, this is a great opportunity. Believe it or not, George, many in our audience are clergy. Tell us where you went to school, if your school still exists, and if it didn't, why you think it failed. And if it's still there, tell us why you think it, it, it still exists. Um, I'm well, I'll be the first answer. My no. school exists, Yale, but it failed. <laughs> it failed. <laughs> but it's still there because of all these billions of dollars that yeah, they've they, got in inherited money. Yeah, they, they have a, an endowment <clears throat> that will last generations. But Yale as an institution has completely failed. If you look at its original cornerstone, uh, four paragraphs of why they were formed, they have failed. Uh, you know, they, they talk about uh, promoting Christ and, uh, and and helping kids live a Christian life. And, yeah, you're not there anymore. Uh, now, the Har purpose of Yale University and the Divinity School is to employ administrators. Yes. So I think there's like one administrator for every one and a half students or something. Something like that, yeah. Harvard, the same way. Harvard used – people don't know this. Harvard used to have a, a, a theological seminary, George. 
still does still does it's just it has no influence on the world no no so yeah so tell us where you went to school and whether your school is still around i, I think i'd like to to know that uh we still have time here now i told you youtube is promoting long format videos don't look at your watch george we're going to another couple minutes here so long format video let's talk about uh welby and pope francis it looks like they went on vacation together I've seen lots of pictures of them together, and uh, it, it's causing some controversy. Let's talk about that, George. Well, just as the Anglo the <laughs> Anglican sphere is blowing up uh, in the U.S. over mere Anglicanism, the uh, Anglican ordinariate or the convert from Anglicanism to Catholicism sphere and conservative traditional Catholics are blowing up over Pope Francis and Welby's love fest of the past week. I think they had twenty-five or bishops. Uh, 25 Anglican, 25 Catholic bishops come and spend some time in Rome, then go up to Canterbury. And then the bishops in pairs, each, you know, one of each from each country or province, were then commissioned jointly to go out together to do common works of common good and whatnot. It's all part of the week of Christian unity. Traditional Catholics on level A are furious because Francis is treating Anglican bishops as real bishops. On level B, the former Anglicans are furious because two of these bishops commissioned were Sally Sue Hernandez of Mexico City and Marinez Basoto of Amazonia in Brazil. Francis is treating women Anglican bishops as real bishops, real clergy, functionally real. And then Welby capped it all off by holding at the Pope's invitation an Anglican service and St. Peter's Basilica. Now, last year when uh, the Bishop of uh, Fulham did this, uh, there was a great uproar and finally denunciations because uh, why was he allowed to do this? Well, the answer was, I learned out when I was in Rome later, that it was Francis <clears throat> who let him do it. Francis asked, uh, Bishop of Fulham asked Francis, and Francis said, sure, what the Pope says they can do. Now, Francis has doubled down on, if you will, the recognition of de facto recognition of Anglican orders and Anglicans' women's orders by acting as if this is the sort of thing they would do with the Orthodox, whom there's just no question about the validity of their orders from a Catholic mindset. Yeah, yeah. But now, Francis has taken this to the Anglicans <clears throat> as well. And the women bishops have not been shy in going back to Brazil and back to Mexico City and telling the newspapers. I got a that, selfie with the Pope. <laughs> and that the Pope has commissioned me along with the Archbishop of Mexico City and whatnot to do this work together. So this is just causing uh, a great deal of grief for our Amongst former those who, uh, friends. Who uh, swam the, uh, the Tigris and drowned. Not the Tigris, the Tiber. Does the Tiber, sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. You Kevin, have you been drinking your espresso? It's it's starting to die off now. So, <laughs> uh, so the, yes. but but the other thing Francis did this week ties into our first story. Okay. Where Francis, who is accused of uh, following a critical theory in his practices, basically has uh confirmed this. He uh reaffirmed his statement that issued on December 18th on blessing of same-sex couples, where Francis said, we're blessing the people, the couples, but not what they do as couples. Which, Francis being a Jesuit, I think he could tease that one to death. But And then he went on to say, but we're going to give the Africans a break because culturally they disagree with what I'm doing, but in time they will see the light. Now, if you remember... At the 1998 Lambeth Conference, Jack Spong, who at that time was Bishop of Newark and was the man of the hour, the liberal lion, he was on uh, the Bill Maher show. That's right. Um, he was on. Ta he went. Was he on Ted Ted Koppel? He got him too. Ted Koppel. Yeah. Uh, he was yeah. everywhere. Yeah. His books were being sold by secular publishers. And at the Lambeth Conference in '98, Andrew Carey nailed this guy, where. Jack Spong gave a little talk, and essentially he said the Africans are uh, uh, basically only one step up from the jungle. 
In other words, they do not have the intellectual heritage to be able to understand these new modern theories. And this blew up everywhere from Desmond Tutu to, you know, everybody just said, Jack, this is racist. And Frank Griswold had to meet with Emmanuel Collini, who was the primate of Rwanda. And Collini and uh, Archbishop Adetoloye of Nigeria, the primate of Nigeria, Griswold met with the Rwandans and Nigerians to apologize on behalf of the Episcopal Church for, for uh, Jack Spong's statement that the Africans are culturally and intellectually naive. Francis is now saying the same thing that the you know that uh, black African Catholic clergy are not as sophisticated as we white clergy, but we'll give them time to catch up in a generation or two. That's a wonderful thing to say. Say we're going to give you, we're going to give, and this is, but this is intersectional intersectionality. This it is, is binary is. thinking. There's black thinking and white thinking. Mm -hmm. White thinking is real thinking, and the poor blacks in Africa, that's black thinking. Well, we just have to tolerate it because they're not as bright as we are, according uh, to Francis. Oh, come on. I read in a, an Acne Bishop attacking a, a black priest from the UK, you know, uh, uh, about attacking white women clergy. It's it just, uh, you know, uh, it, we are going to be employed forever, George. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the great thing about Anglican Inc., in that... Uh, we have bishops to report on, and we'll always have silly things said. All right. Is that it? Is uh, oh, come on! Do we have enough time? We sure, have four minutes. Not? You want to? You want to do Alistair in four minutes? Sure. Why not? Okay. Who Who is Alistair Begg? Alistair hey. Begg is a Scottish Baptist who, for the last thirty years, has uh, led a Presbyterian Calvinist congregation in Cleveland, I believe. Mm -hmm. And he has a very popular TV and radio show, and I met him in the car, and it's on. I'll listen to it. I won't turn the channel. I won't seek it out, but if it's there, I listen. And Alistair Begg has a little section where he's asked questions, and he wrote something about, I, somebody asked about going to a gay wedding. And Alistair Begg said, yeah, you probably should. You should probably should actually choose, uh, uh, you choose love and charity over doctrinal formality. Well, did love wins? And, That's Rob Bell. That's Rob Bell. Uh, and this has caused as much heart failure in certain circles as Francis welcoming women bishops, as uh, Alex Farmer calling uh, Calvin Robinson demon possessed, because Alistair Begg has lost the plot, and so there are he one radio network took him off the air. Um, how could a Calvinist ever lose the plot? I don't get that at all. Well, yeah. you know, Kevin, we had one viewer who asked me this exact same question a few yeah. years ago, yeah. and I gave an Episcopal answer. Well, which is what? I said, skip the wedding, go to the reception. If they have free drinks at the reception, go to the reception. Uh, Do yeah. not honor the religious service yeah. if you disagree with it, but go to the social service where you mm -hmm. have an obligation to be polite. Yeah. In, in the near future, so I have a friend who will be asking me, to go to his wedding, and uh, he's gonna he's gonna get the uh, the the Jesus Christian answer, uh, and it, 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 not, not to let you know uh, and think about this, I will not be attending it. Of course not. Don't. It, it, don't. However, if he's having a reception and uh, there's and what time's uh, the clubhouse uh, open? Yeah, it was you know come, that that's different. But uh, when you invoke uh, something that cannot be blessed. Um, uh, certainly from the heavenly realms, I suggest we don't do so at the, uh, at the, uh, the earthly realms, but that's just me. I'm, I'm a, I'm a phobe of some sort. I gotta be, I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 841 of Anglican Unscripted.